Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final session of this workshop. I hope everyone can hear me. I would like to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon session. Um, please welcome um, Ghanim Ulla. Um, I met Ghanim Ulla eight years ago at a biophysics conference in San Diego. And I suppose we were fierce competitors at that time because we both published models on the IP3 receptor at exactly the same point in time. But there we were in this gigantic uh, hall full of hundreds of posters, literally. And I have to say that I had the best time at this conference with Gamnim when we explained our models of the IP3 receptor to each other. At that time, um, Ghanim was the postdoc in Los Alamos with John Pearson, but I should really start with the beginning, I think. Um, Ghanim received his bachelor and master's degrees in physics from the University of Peshawar in Pakistan. He then moved to the University of Ohio um, and did a PhD with Peter Young in uh, 2006. He was then a postdoc with Stephen Schiff at Pennsylvania State University before he moved to Los Alamos to John Pearson's group. And since 2013, he is at the Department of Physics at the University of South Florida, where he currently is associate professor. I will disappear now and um, let the stage uh, open for you. <laughs> I'm looking forward okay. to your talk. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Ivo, um, and, and, and congratulations for putting such a wonderful um, workshop together. It was long overdue. So um, I'm going to talk about something which is slightly different than what we have been hearing in, the, in this workshop so far. Um, it's uh, amyloid beta uh, uh, pores, and if you don't know what they are, they are... Um, these are peptides that are accumulated in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. Uh, and they do all kind of bad things to the, to the brain and, and specifically um, to the calcium signaling in different ways. So um, I'm going to start with uh, uh, the contributions. Um, uh, all the experiments were done by Angelo, uh, who is at U University of California, Irvine. Uh, Dr. Shah did the software development and the modeling. Um, and he is a postdoc in my lab, and, and, and the work is funded by NIH through this, uh, through this grant. So um, what are the questions that we hope to address with this work? Um, as I said, uh, amyloid beta are the main hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And they target several aspects of calcium signaling, uh, what we want to find out is that what are the key pathways that are involved in the calcium impairment. So calcium signaling is impaired in neurons and, and astrocytes and microglia, everything that you name it, it's impaired in Alzheimer's disease. And we want to know uh, what are the pathways for that. Um, and then what are the primary downstream targets for these impairments? So those are basically the two main questions that we are uh, trying to address. Um, so what do these um, amyloid beta do? If you take some oligomers of amyloid beta and you apply them to the extracellular space of the cell, neuron or any other type of cell, and you wait for a few minutes, they will make pores in the plasma membrane. Actually, they can make pores in any membrane, plasma membrane, the ER, the mitochondria, all the intracellular organelles. And those pores are permeable to calcium and, and other um, cations. But we are interested in calcium, so I'll focus on that. If you apply them intracellularly, if you inject them into the cell, uh, they can generate IP3 through the PLC pathway. And um, the extracellular A beta can do the same. They, they go inside, we believe they go inside and they generate IP3 Similarly, um, the intracellular A beta can make pores in the plasma membrane and, and the other membranes. Uh, so now, if you look at the, through a microscope, um, to, if you look at a piece of membrane, that, this is what you see. These pores open and close like normal ion channels. They have very interesting properties. 
um, and and they evolve over time, and they bring in a lot of calcium to the uh, to the cell. So um, for this talk, I will mostly focus on the amyloid beta pores. Uh, we have done some work on the PLC pathway as well, but um, that may be some other time. Um, so before I tell you about these, this, the data and uh, and the modeling of it, I, I want to tell you um, the the experimental protocol, kind of a cartoon version of it. Uh, and I think this is really important to this. This slide is probably the most important slide in the talk to understand why the modeling is is a little challenging. So when we apply amyloid beta, we wait for about twenty minutes. The pores are formed. Uh, and then we image a membrane, uh, typically 40 by 40 micrometer size membrane. And we make a movie of that membrane for about 30 seconds where we have about 15,000 uh, frames in the movie. Now we have to, ideally, we want to image these pores for at least an hour or longer to see their long-term evolution because they do evolve over time. Uh, but we cannot do that because that would damage the, the laser would damage the membrane. So we wait for five minutes. We make another 30 second movie. We wait for five minutes, make another 30 second movie. And we keep doing that for as long as uh, we can do it and, and as long as the cell survives. So um, we have a gap of information here. We, we basically look at the, at the pores for 30 seconds. And then there is this 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 gap um, that we have to wait and then observe the pores again. And things happen during those five five minutes. Things a lot of things change as you will see. So um, what we are interested in is what happens to the number of pores over time. For example, if we see um, if we see hundred pores here, here we might see maybe two hundred or fifty. The the number doesn't remain the same and and. So that's the one question that we are trying to understand our address. Uh, what are the gating properties of individual pores at a given time? If we analyze the pores at this point, for example, how they behave, how they gate, uh, and then how they evolve when we move from, you know, from one movie to another to another, uh, how their gating properties change over time. So those are the questions that we are trying to address. So this is, this is basically three step process. Uh, step one, uh, amyloid beta pores are extremely small. They are, they are, uh, the flux through them is, usu is, is, is typically smaller than your, t uh, than, than your usual uh, ion channels. And they have really low open probability. So that makes it even harder to detect them because you see them about in every 100 millisecond, you will see them for five, six millisecond um, they, are, they will be open for five, six milliseconds, and, and then the rest of the time they are closed. Um, and there are a lot of them. Um, if you wait longer, you will see thousands of these pores in a, in a 40 by 40 micrometer membrane. Uh, so we need to, uh, we needed automatic methods to detect, to, to locate basically where these pores are and, and then analyze them in, in a more efficient way. So to do that, we, um, we developed this software called Cell Specs. Um, I, the details are in this biophysical journal paper that came out two, uh, in 2018. Uh, but I'll just briefly tell you what this does. So it, when you load your movies, our, our, our TIFF images, um, the movie state, uh, it does a few steps to, to identify the channel locations. Uh, and those steps are basically explained in the paper, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, it will identify all the channels in the in the membrane, and then you can you can uh, investigate single channels. You can just click on an individual channel in in this window, and it will show you a time trace, the idealized trace for the for the gating of the pore. Um, it can also um, it, it, so it makes a, a, a location map of all the pores. And at the same time, you can also save all the time traces for all the pores in the, in the membrane. So it doesn't matter how many there are, there could be thousands of them. You just click a button and it will save all the time traces for all the pores in the movie. Um, 
and then it generates some nice statistics that you can use for you know just looking at what the pores are doing you can use them later for modeling and so on like uh, uh, the open duration for example the mean open duration of the of the channel and as you can see uh, they are typically open for a few milliseconds 10 to 15 milliseconds most of them um, their closed duration is extremely long it can go up to four seconds and the open probability is as i said it's really low um, and and then uh, the the maximum amplitude is they have a wide range of, of properties basically uh, but it's really easy to 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 extract them using cell specs so um, one interesting if you are a, you know when when you are a modeler you kind of look for these interesting things um, is that these channels they have multiple conductance levels so you have an open state it will open to first conductance level second third and so on and it can go up to six conductance levels i have shown five here and i'll show you in a, in a few slides how we get these idealized spaces where we take the the time place which shows the fluorescence signal to um, uh, to basically extract just the the idealized place but uh, but they have multiple conductance levels their open probability varies a lot uh, and as time goes by you will see that they will go from a state where initially they would open in one conductance level to maybe two three or even five six conductance levels so they are really interesting um, to study in in modern um, but as i said they evolve over time so for example here in this case we tracked um, five pores over time so in the first movie as i said after 20 minutes after adding the uh, the mli beta we 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 made a movie up of 20 seconds in this case and you can see that these five pores, two are completely silent almost, and um, and then the other three are showing some activity. Uh, but as you move in time, 30 minutes, 35, by the time you reach 60 minutes, uh, they show a lot of activity. Their open probability is big. Their mean open time uh, is, is longer. We mean close time is shorter. And this is a general trend in them. They basically evolve. They get bigger, more toxic over time. So another thing that we can do with, um, with cell specs, uh, as I said, you can, you can generate a, a location map where these channels are in, in a given movie. Uh, so we, we generate a location map uh, for one movie, and then we, we wait five minutes. Um, then there is the second movie. We generate a, a, a location map for that. Uh, we keep doing that. And we can put these maps on top of each other to, to identify the pores that appear uh, uh, in multiple movie stacks. Uh, uh, some, are, some, some of the channel would just appear in one movie and then they would completely disappear because we know their location in the experiment. We don't do, when we don't move the, uh, the apparatus, we don't move the, uh, the cells, everything is fixed so we know um, that a pore appearing in the first movie uh, where it should appear in the second movie and so on. Uh, but there are pores that will appear in seven, eight movies, and there are some which will just appear in one and disappear. So we can study their properties uh, individually, the pores that, are, that we call common pores, uh, common between different movies, and the pores that are unique, which just appears once and then disappear. So um, if you look at the, um, the mean open time, for example, so I have two different types of bars here. One is red, which is the, all the pores, including the unique and common ones, and then only the unique pores. They both show um, an increasing trend in the op mean open time. Um, as you can see, so on the x-axis, I have the time of recording in minutes. They, they start with relatively low, smaller mean open time, and it increases. Same thing happens for the mean open probability. Both pore types, the unique and common, their mean open probability increases, their uh, maximum amplitude, the maximum flux that you will ever observe through that pore uh, increases over time. So. 
Um, that, so so um, you and, and then you can also uh, you can also look at pores that, for example, are common in two movie states. Um, when you see them the first time, they will have relatively smaller amplitude. Uh, you see them later, the amplitude gets bigger. Same thing goes for mean open probability, the mean open time, all those things that you are interested in. And if you have them in three uh, movie stakes, you see it's the 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 increase in in the amplitude and the the open probabilities is is persistent. So. Um, and, and there are there are some some questions that we are still trying to understand is that these unique ports where do they go? We believe that though they go inside the cell, but that's something that we have to be certain and figure out yet. But anyway, they they do have really interesting properties. So um, and and they um, the, the the bad thing about them is that they are more active at the resting membrane potential. So if you look at the if you record the fluorescence or uh, the flux to these pores at zero millivolt membrane potential, there is not much going on, minus 40, a lot of flux going through and minus 80, which is close to the resting membrane of the neuron. Huge, huge flux, um, calcium flux through the pores. And so here is your, um, your plot, the, the, the fluorescence amplitude or the flux, the, the average flux through, this, uh, through these pores around minus 80 is when it's maximum basically so that's a bad thing because that's where this, the the neuronal and the estrocytic membrane potential is sitting and you really don't want to ha that to happen um, zinc uh, turns out to block these pores uh, reversibly so this is uh, a beta 42 um, at minus 80 millivolt uh, just six seven examples from you know from the pores you apply zinc at the same under the same conditions, um, a lot of these pores are silent. You, you just see some noise, but most of them are silent. Uh, and then you can look at the all the pores in the experiment in the membrane. So in this case, we have uh, along this axis, we have the pore number starting from one to more than four hundred pores in this experiment. And then on the x axis, we have time, uh, and each bright parts represents, uh, it tells you that the pore was open at that time. So as you can see, there's a lot of activity going on over time in the, in the membrane. When we apply zinc, most of the activity disappears. You wash out zinc, the, the activity appears again. So they are blocked by, by zinc and it's a reversible effect, we believe that. Okay, so what is the second step now? We, we are trying to move towards the modeling of it. So, uh, when we talk about modeling single channel data, we, um, we basically need idealized traces, traces which tells us open, close, open in one conductance level, two, and so on. And then we need um, dwell times distribution. So it's a, if, you, if you want to do this for single traces for thousands of poles, it's, it's a daunting job. So we develop another uh, automatic software uh, that we call um, trace specs. So it's a series uh, trace specs uh, after cell specs. Uh, but this is, um, again, it's a really nice software. You just click a few buttons, you load your trace, a noisy, it can be fluorescence trace, it can be from page clamp experiments. Uh, it removes the drift, the background noise, and gives you a nice idealized um, idealized trace and and you can you can you can look at the trace by investigating and just observing it observing it and if it doesn't make sense you go back and, and redo it just change one parameter or the other and it will fix it for you and if you like running codes in the terminal you basically can run it over uh, we have provided the the software and the source code with it um, in the publication. So you can run the code on, on thousands of, of traces in one go. And, and what you get at the end is these idealized traces, things like the mean open probability, mean um, close time, open time, and the dwell time distribution, which is what you need for modeling. So it's another useful thing to have. Um, so as I said, um, uh, 
the you you take fluorescence traces, you get idealized traces. These these uh, these spores they evolve over time. They will initially have low open probability, low amplitude, and then the amplitude and open probability increases over time. So we take these idealized traces. Oh, and then as I said, um, you generate the dwell times. So for example, the dwell times in the conductance level one, for example, would look like this. Conductance level two, three, four, and so on. It, it doesn't matter how many conductance levels you have. You could have more than five or six, and, and it generates these, uh, these distributions for you. So um, then we have the third step, which is which we, we take these traces and the, and the distributions and model them. Um, so that's what we do. Just to quickly remind you that there is an information gap uh, in the experiment. So we will model the pores activity at this time, at you know, 20 minutes after the, after the uh, um, the application of A beta. And then we will model it again at 30 minutes, uh, 25 minutes and 30 minutes and so on. And then we need to, to merge those models um, to, to get an idea that how they evolve over time. So we, each, each movie frame is modeled by a separate Markov chain model and then we put them together. Okay, so you can do this um, Q, since the, these models are, um, are the, the rates are not really complicated. They are basically constant. So you can use QUB for modeling them. You can write your own subroutine, use things like maximum uh, likelihood um, to estimate these rates. And the way we do that, we start with the simplest possible model. So we know there is one closed state and we know there are up to five open conductance levels. So we have one closed state, five open states. Uh, and then we fit this model to the, to the dwell time distribution in, in closed state and in, in the dwell times in all open states. And we optimize these rates. Uh, we also try to make the model a little, um, a little complex to see if the, the outcome uh, improves. And if it improves significantly, we keep the model. Otherwise, we, we just stick to the simple possible model. And in most cases, basically, the more complexity doesn't improve, aid much to the model. So we just stick with the simpler model. So um, and the lines here, so the distributions are basically the red is the experimental data and the lines are the fits from the two models. Uh, and then you can also look at the, compare the open probability uh, for each subconductance level. Um, this is, this should be subconductance level. Uh, mean open time and see how the model compares. And it, it compares really well because, um, because it's, you know, it's basically the model is derived from the data, so it shouldn't have huge discrepancy with the data. Okay, so we do, we get these rates, um, these forward and backward rates um, at different times after we start the experiment. Then, so we will have, if we have 10 movies, for example, we will have 10 values for, for, the, for each rate constant at different times. Then we take those and we fit some simple functions to these rate constants. So now you have a, the rate constants are a function of time now. So if you want to model the, the poor uh, 20 minutes later, um, you, will, you will have a one constant. For example, this is the forward constant between closed state and subconductance level one. Uh, you will use this value, otherwise you, you, you basically take the value corresponding to the time from the, from the point where you, you added your MLI beta. So, um, and this is clearly, it tells you that they do change, that their kinetics change over time. Uh, so we get these rates and now we can, we can model them basically at any time. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you want to look at your properties 10 minutes later or, or, or 10 hours later, you, you, you have the model which is based on the data. And then you can do all kind of cool stuff with it, which is what we are beginning to do now is to put them in, in the membranes and, you know, uh, synapses and see how they affect the, the function of these different, um, these different cell functions. So, the model, uh, it closely follows, um, which is no surprise because everything is based on the experiment. 
uh, it follows the experimental data. The mean open probability is a function of time, the mean open time, um, you know, the mean close time, and also um, the probability, the mean open probability in, um, in each conductance level. So we have five subconductance levels um, and we basically, um, it, it does a really good job in taking the, the, the dynamics or the kinetics of the pores. One thing that I want to point out here is that this is the subconductance level one and um, I believe this is the, yeah, this is the open probability of the subconductance level one and it increases over time. Actually, the open probability of each conductance level increases over time. But, um, but if you compare the individual probabilities, here it's 0 0.01 and goes to 0 0.02, the higher conductance level are very rarely visited. So the, the, the toxicity increases over time, but we believe that it's mostly because the open probability, uh, the probability to visit the lowest subconductance level more frequently is causing this, this toxicity. So um, that's basically uh, all I have. Uh, I'll just summarize um, the, the uh, amylide beta oligomers form pores in the membrane with a wide range of gating properties. Uh, I hope I have convinced you of that. These pores have multiple conductance levels the maximum conductance and open probability of pores increase with time. Pores become more toxic over time because their conductance, probability, um, they all basically increase over time. Uh, and zinc can block these pores reversibly. But for us, the, I think the most important thing as a, as a modeler is that this gives us an opportunity to to model um, ion channels in the in their native environment because the imaging experiments are done on, on these pores or, or, or channels in their native environment. So I think we, we, we think this is a really powerful approach to, to see how the, the channels behave in their native environment. So I'm going to stop here and, and take questions. Thank you very much, Ghanim, for your really nice talk. Um, I have Two questions from the audience. So um, the first one from Maurizio. Garim, I might have missed it. Could you say a bit more clearly how the software helps detect the pores based on the uh, calcium dependent readout, I assume. But this only works in cultures, I assume. How can I debunk pore activity in real tissue where likely extracellular calcium homeostasis is an important player in the regulation of such pores? So, um, the yeah, question so it's a, is a bit lengthy. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a valid question. So it's a good question. Um, and it, so the first thing that you have to do as an experimentalist, you have to make sure that what you are imaging is, is basically the channel that you are interested in. And that's we, what we made sure. We, um, we basically pharmacologically blocked all the channels um, and and then another test was, we, since these were the channels in the plasma membrane, we removed the extracellular calcium and made sure that the, uh, the, the fluxes disappear if, you, if there is no, um, no extracellular calcium. Um, and the driving force, zinc is another test where we apply zinc and, and, and the channels disappear. So. Uh, the software basically, to answer your question, it wouldn't be able to tell you if you see two spots, it wouldn't be able to tell you if that spot appears because of voltage gated calcium channel, for example, or amylide beta pore. Because all it does is it, it looks for the intensity, the fluorescence. Uh, so you have to, in, in the experiment, you have to first separate the, the channels that you are imaging. And then the software basically is, you know, it's, it just looks at the intensity. So uh, to to kind of differentiate multiple channels and, and that too, you will have to know their properties very well. You could probably use something like machine learning tools, um, but not, not this software. It wouldn't be able to differentiate between the two. So, um, Ghanim, there are further questions, but the problem is that we have run out of time a bit. So, okay. um, 
I would like to invite the next speaker on uh, stage, but I thank you for your talk. And um, if you like, you can um, answer the questions in the ask a question field and possibly also on Neurostars. Thanks a lot. Um, I have now invited on stage um, our next speaker, um, Silvina Ponce Dawson. Um, Silvina received her PhD in 1988 from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina in theoretical plasma physics. And in her research career, she has made contributions to statistical mechanics and nonlinear dynamics. She has a long standing interest in spatiotemporal models of calcium dynamics, which will also be the topic of her talk, I think. For many years, Sivina has served the physics community in the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, UPAP. She led the Women in Physics Working Group, for example, is the vice president elected at large with gender champion duties of UPAP. And most recently, she has been appointed to the acting president designate of the UPAP. Currently, Silvina is a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. I'm looking forward to her talk. Okay, thank you. So let me share an application. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Very Good. nice. Thank you. Okay. So a, I prepared a talk that was the uh, research was originated in a behavior in neurons, particularly in synaptic plasticity, although I've been thinking of other things afterwards. And this is work that we've done mostly with Ana Calabrese. I am also going to show some experiments that Cecilia did, and then Herman is now taking over the uh, work of Anna's. Okay, so this is about synaptic plasticity that we've heard quite a bit yesterday, and in which calcium plays a very important role. And the efficacy of the synaptic transmission depends on the activity and can be modified. And the examples, uh, experimental examples are what are called long-term potentiation and depression. And this means an increase or decrease in synaptic efficacy that can be elicited uh, in different ways. And one way is stimulating the pre and the postsynaptic neurons almost simultaneously, but with a certain delay and depending on where you apply the stimulus first, you then have potentiation or depression. So, We've heard about this yesterday, and this is the, uh, the plot where you see, depending on the relative timing of the pre and postsynaptic stimulation, which is the training that is going to change the synaptic efficacy, then when you look at how the synapse uh, responds to one stimulus, you, you see that it can be depressed with respect to the level before the training, or it can be potentiated. And well, this a change in the synaptic strength can last for weeks. Here is shown only for a few, 50 minutes or something. Here you have LTP. This is how the response looks like in some units before the training, then you apply the training where the uh, arrow is here. And then you again apply the same stimulus as before and see what the response looks like. And you see it either enhanced or depressed. And sometimes you don't see any change. Anyway, and there are many factors that participate in this change of the synaptic strength. And one important factor is calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum, which is depicted here, through IP3 receptors and also ryanodine receptors. And both ryanodine receptors and IP3 receptors are subject to what is called calcium-induced calcium release that is depicted here for the case of IP3 receptors that need not only calcium bound to the receptor to become open, but also IP3, so two things bound to the channel to, for the channel to become open. And so here this, they are on the membrane 
of the um, endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, if you have IP3, and so IP3 is bound to the correct sites of the, uh, of the channel of the receptor, then when calcium is also bound, uh, the channel becomes open, calcium is released, and the very same calcium that is released diffuses and can act upon other channels. And so you can, other channels that have IP3 bound, and then you can have this propagating calcium wave. Now, the, in the case of IP3 receptors that we've seen some models today, calcium cytosolic calcium plays a dual role because it's activating at low concentrations and inhibitory at high ones. And the simplest kinetic model, so, so, sorry for this drawing, which is very bad, but it's to illustrate the thing, would be something like having two, uh, one, one binding site for IP3 and then two binding sites for calcium, one of a uh, high affinity and so that calcium binds with high probability even at low concentrations and the other of much uh, lower affinity so that you need a much higher calcium concentration to bind to that site. And if calcium binds to the, to the high affinity site and IP3 is also bound, then the channel can become open and calcium goes through. While if calcium is bound to the, uh, low, low, to the low affinity site, then a, the channel is inhibited. Anyway, another key uh, component of synaptic plasticity is other types of receptors that are on the plasma membrane of the uh, postsynaptic neuron, particularly NMDA receptors that are also calcium channels, but they are usually blocked. Their pore is blocked by magnesium, and so you need to change the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron for the magnesium to be kicked out of the pore and so calcium can get through. So they are, that's why you have some coincidence thing. It's like a coincidence detector, the NMDR. And then LTP and LTD is associated to changes uh, in the level of cytosolic calcium in such a way that, well, this, this would be like basal calcium, so you don't have any synaptic modification. But then if you have some intermediate calcium concentrations, you have depression because you activate some phosphatases that turn down the uh, conductivity of some channels or even they can let them get invaginated. And then if you have higher concentration, then you potentiate those channels. It's kinases that act on the channels, and so you have the potentiation of the synaptic strength. The thing is that because calcium does not stay in a region but can spread about, not always because there is these buffers that don't let them go very far away from its point of entry, but you can regenerate the signal through calcium-induced calcium release, then a, the uh, synaptic modification does not stay at the homosynapse. It also can change the heterosynapse. And so other synapses, not the ones that you trained with these protocols that lead to either LTD or LTP. And in particular, this is important because in the, uh, if you have excitation in a so synaptic strength that is becoming more uh, higher and higher, then that can be you need something something to compensate for that for the for the whole network to be stable. And apparently, uh, these heterosynaptic changes can help uh, normalize and stabilize these strength. And in these heterosynaptic changes, calcium released through IP3 receptors plays a role. And so the work we looked at with Anna is a work which is a, an old work, but it may, did all sorts of experiments that are very interesting. And um, so this is the uh, schematic uh, scheme of the, uh, of the type of experiments they, they did. It was in hippocampus. And so this is the postsynaptic neuron. And this is what is called the homosynaptic pathway, and this is the heterosynaptic pathway. And in the upper box, I'm going to uh, illustrate what happens in LTP and here what happens in LTD. And basically, uh, if you uh, put some uh, stimulus in the homosynaptic pathway, which is this red thing here, 
then you see this type of response in the postsynaptic neuron. If you do the same in the heterosynaptic pathway, you see this response. This is before you train the, you do the, either the ELTP or the LTD protocol. And so the LTP and LTD protocol in this case means that you apply some stimuli, a, I don't see my here, a, at, a, on the postsynaptic neuron and the homosynaptic pathway with a certain order. It could be that the postsynaptic neuron comes after or it comes before. And so in one case, you will have LTP, in the other, you are going to have LTD. And this training means a tetanic stimuli. So it means uh, with a frequency. And so then you again apply the same, the same stimulus that you had applied before the training. And you see what's the, uh, uh, to the homosynapse and to the heterosynapse, and see what's the response. And in the case of the LTP protocol in this paper, what they observed, of course, they observed LTP at the homosynapse, and they didn't observe any change at the heterosynapse. And in the case of the LTD protocol, they observed LTD at the homosynapse and LTD at the heterosynapse. So these are some of the, the results that were obtained in this paper. They also blocked type E3 receptors and ryanodine receptors. And from those experiments, they arrived at various conclusions. I'm going to quote only two. One is that the RP3 receptors, uh, the activity of the receptors determines this, what they call the polarity of the synaptic change. By this, they mean that LTP is restricted to the homosynapse while LTD propagates from the homosynapse to the heterosynapse. And then the release from ryanodine receptors is also very important for the induction of LTD. And so they produced in that paper some, this, what we call a qualitative model, a, in which they say, well, this is a spine, and this is the dendrite, and this is another spine. So this is like the spine that you trained, and this is the heterosynapse. And you see, this is the membrane, the plasma, the membrane of the neuron, and this is the endoplasmic reticulum in pink, sort of. And so you have all these players here. In particular, you have the ryanodine receptors localized in the spine, but then the IP3 receptors are all along the, the dendrite, so that the IP3 receptors allow for the propagation of a calcium wave, and so that calcium can spread by a regenerative process from the homosynapse to the heterosynapse and change the synaptic efficacy afterwards. Okay, and this was confirmed by other works afterwards. So uh, we wanted to understand uh, this propagation. And to this end, we developed two models. One, a model for the dynamics of calcium in the homosynaptic spine, and then a model for the propagation of the IP3 receptor mediated calcium wave. And so uh, putting them together, it's a one dimensional model in space in which we are going to have, I'm sorry, the, some of the figures are in Spanish though. Anyway, so this is a, the spine um, where you have calcium entry from the extracellular medium and then this is going to diffuse. And also at the spine, you will have production of IP3 through metabotropic receptors that when the neurotransmitter gets bound to them, then they start to produce IP3 from precursors on the plasma membrane. And so then you will have the, um, a propagation of the weight or not. And actually this is sort of a, an image of the dendrite and the spines that can be different uh, sizes stuff, but we are going to have this one dimensional model. So uh, for the spine model, we pretty much took what Schuval did in 2002, and, but we added something to account for some of the uh, observations of Nishiyama et al, which was this release through ryanodine receptors and also uh, potassium channels that are calcium mod modulated, which are these SK channels. So basically, Schuval's model, uh, for them, the calcium dynamics is mostly due to the uh, current through the NMDA receptors, and then there is some removal. And then uh, for that, in that current, you have something that is related to the presynaptic 
conditioning and the postsynaptic conditioning that is going to change what the conductivity of the MDA receptors is basically. And then there is something that is related to the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron. And this is what we changed slightly with respect to Chuvals. Chuvals considered the back propagating action potential, something through these other receptors that change the voltage to kick out magnesium ions from the from MDA uh, pores. And then we added also some change due to this uh, potassium channels that are modulated by calcium. And for that, we used some experimental research results to model that part of the uh, contribution to the uh, postsynaptic potential. So with that, we obtained the different behaviors in the dynamics of calcium, depending on it, if it was LTP or LTD. And then we put that into the, um, we wanted to couple that to the propagation. And for the propagation, we used a fire diffuse fire model, basically, where U is the concentration of calcium with an effective diffusion coefficient, number of ions that are released per unit time, and that's a stochastic. And then a, the channels, the receptors are located in particular points that are uh, separated by two microns, by these two microns. And then you have calcium pumps. And for the um, release of calcium, we, we produced a stochastic cluster model that we uh, constructed based on observations of Ian Parker's uh, group. Basically, it was a model for the cluster, a closed state for the cluster where the transition to the open state that was proportional to calcium and modulated by IP3, but basically a threshold. And then the release was also considered to be stochastic because we are assuming the cluster is a bunch of channels, so we don't know what the current is going to be. So that's taken from a distribution. And then two inhibited states, one that is calcium modulated and the other one that is not. And we put that into our one-dimensional model of, this, of the dendrite with 15 channels. And the initial condition was everything was basal. The clusters were closed, 15 clusters actually. And then we put the spine model in one, at one end and we considered that the uh, heterosynapse was a like 500 nanometers away from the last cluster, which was the 15th one. And the, the domain of the integration is double the domain where the clusters are. So first we studied with uniform IP3 and we couldn't uh, reproduce this observation that LTP was restricted to the homosynapse and um, hetero, the, um, that LTD propagated to the heterosynapse. So if the way that we look at is by looking at calcium at the homosynapse and at the heterosynapse after when we apply one or the other protocol. This is for the LTD protocol, and this is for the LTP protocol. So we have an enhancement of the calcium concentration in the homosynapse, but at the heterosynapse, we also see an intermediate increase of calcium. It would be LTD and not basal. And the, so then we thought, well, a IP3 is being produced at the spine, and we were thinking that IP3 was uniform everywhere. And so we added a, um, so we, we said, how are we going to change that the uh, LTP, which means high calcium concentration is restricted to the homosynapse and it, it's low and basal at the heterosynapse. When, when you increase to intermediate value at the homosynapse, you also have intermediate at the heterosynapse. And so uh, the way that we, thought of was that we had to include the dynamics of IP3 because calcium plays this dual role. So we thought if calcium arrives at the clusters before IP3 does, then the clusters might go into an inhibited state and then the, the wave is not going to propagate. And that's more likely to happen in the case of the LTP because of the higher calcium concentration. While if you have moderate levels of calcium, then uh, it's not so probable that calcium will bind to the uh, inhibitory sites of the of the channels, and so you will have the propagating wave. 
So the relative time at which IP3 and calcium arrives at the clusters determines whether the waves can propagate or not. And the way we included that was a very simple way with a diffusion equation for IP3 and a, with a coefficient that we took from all Britain, which is 250 micron square per second. And the way that we could reproduce at least more or less qualitatively the observations was assuming that IP3 was delayed in its production by 500 milliseconds. And so then we could reproduce that with the LTD protocol, we had intermediate increment at the homosynapse and also at the heterosynapse, and then large increment at the homosynapse for LTP and almost basal at the heterosynapse. And these are a, at the heterosynapse is a, a mean over 100 realizations. So uh, this, whether the wave propagates or not depends on this, on whether IP3 or calcium arrives first at the clusters. And so I'm going to connect this with other results. And in particular, um, in this paper, they say that these IP3 receptors are coincidence detectors because they need to detect the mobilization of IP3 and uh, the postsynaptic calcium signaling at the same time. And what we see in our studies is not just the coincidence, but also the relative timing of building up one concentration or the other and how it gets transported into the cell. And so, and so this is a very delicate balance that can be change in various ways by buffering and also if ryanodine receptors participate of the release in certain points along the, the wave. And well, this, uh, this uh, form of training the synapse uh, with this delay of the timing between what you do to the pre and the postsynaptic uh, neuron, it's been observed that you produce different things depending on the cell. So, this is because of this very delicate balance that you can have different behaviors, basically. And this is because of the dual role of calcium wafing on IP3 receptors. And it's interesting that some other works have seen different behaviors depending on whether you elicited some response with IP3 only or and with basal calcium, or if you pair that response with calcium entry due to action potentials. And finally, I want to mention that the values we used of the diffusion coefficients come from this very old paper by Albritton et al., which is from 1992, I forgot the, the year, and in which they say that IP3 diffuses at 280 micron square per second, that calcium is strongly buffered. So here you have an effective diffusion coefficient as a function of the free calcium concentration. And the uh, maximum value that they say that calcium could reach in its diffusion, which is the free diffusion coefficient, is 220 microns per second. But in recent works with Ian Parker, we observed that IP3 seems to be also buffered. These are exam is experiments in which IP3 is caged and released with a new UV flash that is either localized or is like spread along the, the cell. And what you see is uh, what puffs are evoked by one or the other kind of release in IP3. And in particular, what we looked at was the latency to the first puff. And in the case of a localized release of IP3, you see that the latency to the first puff depends on the distance. While if you have the spatial spread of the release of IP3, uh, the latency does not depend. Now, if IP3 diffused at 280 micron square per second, then there shouldn't be this such a large difference between releasing the IP3 at one point or having it spread all over the uh, all over the cell. And so we tried to fit what was the best diffusion coefficient that could account for these differences. And we found between five and 10 microns square per second. So much smaller than the value of all Britons. And then, so, and then regarding calcium, uh, with Cecilia, we've been doing experiments, uh, FCS, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy experiments in Xenopods, Levis, oocytes, and in yeast 
to determine the diffusion coefficient. And basically, in FCS, you take the autocorrelation function and try to fit it with different things. And with, when we fit with two components, there is one that has the largest diffusion coefficient that was for in the all sites. It had a peak, it had like two components itself, but it, it had it, so it looked bimodal. Uh, this is histograms of the values we obtained from the fits, and they are around 300, 400 micron square per second. And in yeast, a little bit smaller, this is yeast under basal condition, this is yeast in high calcium, and then you see that other bump there in the distribution that we have to interpret. Serena, you anyway, have around five minutes. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. You yeah, I am in the okay. <laughs> Thank so, you. So basically what I tried to show you was Nishiyama a long time ago showed that calcium release from internal stores through, oh, the stores went away. Anyway, through IP3 receptors plays an important role in determining the specificity. So that LTP stays in one homosynapse and does not propagate while LTD does propagate and the polarity of synaptic modifications. The simulations of our model, that is a huge simplification, indicate that maybe this is related, this, the specificity of LTP and the non-specificity of LTD uh, to the dual role of calcium on IP3 receptors and whether a, an IP3 mediated calcium wave can propagate or not. Then, a, whether it can propagate or not depends on the relative delay with which IP3 and calcium reach the uh, channels that have to become open to regenerate the way. And that depends on how fast they diffuse. And based on the recent experimental results, we are going to reanalyze these simulations with new diffusion coefficients. And before I stop talking, um, I want to thank the organizers and I wish we could have met in Melbourne that I was going to combine this workshop with uh, attending the IUPAP International Conference of Women in Physics, which was the seventh in a series. This is a picture from the uh, previous one that is attended mostly by, by women, but also men. And there we try to uh, make people aware of what women do in science and try to make visible their work. So this is not to be taken as a recrimination, but just to a recommendation to think, because I, I would have liked to see more women giving talks in this workshop. And this is something we've been also discussing quite a bit, not only in physics, but in all STEM areas. And this is a report a book that we produced with a project, an international and interdisciplinary project. The book is downloadable and has results from a survey that was answered by 34,000 people from over 130 countries, people working in STEM. And so this book is just a call of attention to say that we do science. And given that we were going to have this uh, workshop in the Southern Hemisphere, which is not that common, let me tell you, and I have come from the Southern Hemisphere, a, it's good to turn things a little bit around to look them from a different perspective to make not only the world, but also the, the practice of science a more equitable endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silvina, for your very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? I think I see one popping up. Um, so from Martin Falke, he asks, nice talk. Do you get the dendrite hetero homo synapse also with a small IP3 diffusion coefficient? Uh, well, we haven't tried that, but the, I, I am a, it's what we are starting to analyze. And I am very excited basically because the way in which we could reproduce that different behavior before was by delaying the production of IP3. And so I hope that maybe with the smaller diffusion coefficient, you don't need to introduce this delay in the production of IP3. So that's what I would like to study in more detail. Thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions? Well, I mean, it's still possible to ask questions to Silvina in the ask a question box. Um, 
I would now like to invite um, our next speaker and um, also Maurizio, who will introduce him. Um, but I would like to thank um, Silvina again for her nice talk. Thank you, thank you very much. No, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. Uh, so, Ivo, you are okay. Very good. Uh, you can invite now Evan. I I have uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, this brilliant uh, uh, young investigator, Evan Cresswell Clay, uh, who I had the pleasure to meet last year uh, when I was actually popping in uh, uh, Florida State University for a visit to his. Um, uh, supervisor then, Gordon Erlebacher, who I don't know if he's in the audience right now, and if he is, I say hi, or we say both hi. So <clears throat> I came across Evan's work uh, during his uh, latest years of uh, graduate studies as he was starting an approach, a new one, on uh, how to model calcium signals in uh, astrocytic processes, so the usual compartmental modeling. So he started that uh, that uh, that model, and because he was uh, kind of inspired by some ideas that I had myself in that direction, it turns out that I had the pleasure to uh, uh, be a reviewer of his uh, of his work, of his final thesis work, not only on the thesis but his first article. And then, uh, with that in mind, I said, "Why don't we visit this guy?" And is is. Uh, is uh is, is supervisor and so i pop up in florida where humidity was uh, however good enough to keep me there and have good time during the last summer and so we we had a nice chat and we said why don't we start collaborating and think about something else and some some evolution about this work so <clears throat> i'm very glad because evan eventually i mean was about to finish so you know it's finishing the PhD, he was very stressed, uh, and uh, he had to finish up the results, and then he said, oh, thank you, you arrived, you gave me basically the results for my final thesis. It was, uh, it was you know, a little bit idolatizing, uh, the, the, the one who is speaking, but uh, we said, Evan, why don't we just um, manage to think about working together in the future? And so we wrote together a Fulbright application, and uh, it turns out that we won this Fulbright application. And uh, I don't know if in the audience there is also uh, the third collaborator that Evan, who, who will actually introduce, uh, James Schumers, who is at Florida International University, and some of you may know. So anyways, without any further uh, hesitation, I will let Evan speak, OK? Uh, so it will show mostly some some ideas and some, some concepts or early preliminary work that uh, we are about to develop. And uh, uh, also, I would say that right now, Evan is at NIH, at the lab, at the division um, led by Arthur Sherman, and uh, is actually working on some machine learning and protein folding modeling. So he's really developing a multidisciplinary um, expertise. And uh, with that, with that foot on multi multi protein folding whatever and uh, now is dipping back on calcium and showing you some ideas in that respect and uh, in the in the direction of calcium compartmentalization I was way too long by now so I will let Evan share his presentation and uh, start uh, with his talk good luck Evan thank you Maurizio and uh, I want to start by saying that I am really honored to be here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all about some uh, preliminary work for that Fulbright, uh, Fulbright grant that I was awarded. So yes, I'm good more or I should say good afternoon. Most of you are, are a, it's the afternoon for you. So I'm Evan Cresswell Clay and I'm going to be talking to you about some, uh, some compartmental modeling that we have been doing, uh, incorporating astrocyte physiology and morphology. So I want to start by acknowledging as well the Fulbright and uh, Maurizio for his uh, for his valuable uh, assistance and towards the end of my doctoral work, as well as for uh, for the Fulbright application that we put together. I also want to thank again Gordon Robacher, Florida State University, uh, my PhD advisor, 
uh, whose, whose influence you're going to see in some of the work today as well. And, and finally, I want us to thank James Schumers at uh, Florida International University, FIU, whose uh, experimental work is going to be pivotal moving forward as we carry out this, this uh, Fulbright Fellowship starting in January of next year. So I want to talk to you all about calcium dynamics and astrocytes. And before we go into that, I want to, I want to, just, I want to show you this image from uh, the, the lab of Emmanuel Bochefer. And uh, we're seeing here from left to right different scales of a cutout of the cortex. And this fluorescent imaging is showing us as we move into these smaller scales, this almost galaxy of multicolored cells. And in these cells on the right hand column, you can see these stars, these bright spots, the neurons, which are engulfed and surrounded by these tessellating cells, uh, astrocytes which can be characterized by their very interesting and, and complex uh, morphology. And one of the big questions in the last 20, 25 years has been, you know, how do these cells function and, and how do they operate and what is their influence? And one of the things that I want to be considering is how does the morphology of these cells influence their activity and their function? And when we're talking about astrocyte function, we really need to discuss uh, calcium dynamics cells because calcium is the functional readout, the excitable readout out of these cells. So as an example, I want to show you some work from James's lab where he is taking a mouse and he is uh, giving it some type of visual simulation, in this case, uh, an oriented grating. And he's recording from an astrocyte in the primary visual cortex as he's changing the stimuli. And as we go down through these different calcium traces, which are being recorded from different subcellular region of the same astrocyte, we can automatically notice one thing, which is on the right-hand side of the traces, this uh, universal uh, response to this, this specific green uh, orientation, this green grading. Uh, a response that is not necessarily uh, seen in the first part in the other orientation of that green grading, where you only really see an elicited uh, calcium response in this uh, bottom row for this peripheral process. So this is, this is kind of a, a salient example of the type of subcellular calcium dynamics that you can see within these cells, which in this case are responding in an orientation specific manner to different types of external stimuli. And uh, a work that really really postulated this very well, the first work to really postulate, the seminal work by Volterra in, and uh, et al. in 2014, was to look again at a cell, at, a, at, a, at an astrocyte with these two processes here. In the, and we can see in the top row two different types of characterization of the calcium activity going on in the cell. One on the left hand, the top left, is the cumulative calcium activity within the cell, as well as the frequency of calcium events that we are seeing. And this, uh, this mapping between these two is not one-to-one. -one. We are not seeing a, uh, a complete correlation between the, two, between the two events. We're seeing a lot of activity in the soma, cumulative activity, whereas the frequency is not as strong as compared to some of the other uh, areas in the cell that, while cumulatively, act cumulatively active, are showing much higher frequency. And when you combine these two perspectives, you can start to create this spatiotemporal map of the cell and divide it into these different uh, calcium microdomains or subregions, which could potentially ex express different types of dynamics. For instance, uh, going to this bottom right-hand image, we can have the soma with these high amplitude, uh, maybe less frequent calcium events, while in the periphery in these processes, we're seeing more frequent uh, calcium events with a little bit less activity. And this work is really, is really showing us that that we can start to characterize the activity in these cells through these subcellular domains, through these microdomains, and we want to try to understand their interaction as well as characterize the events within them. But as far as, as, far as characterizing these different events, we, can, uh, we have to incorporate multiple features. And I want to, I want to bring your attention again to an uh, to a, to a astrocyte with a soma and two processes in this great work by Bindachi et al. in 2017 where we're looking at, again, uh, calcium activity within these two processes in the soma, as well as, you know, you know, we have some activity in the end foot and some activity in the gliopil of the cell. 
But what we can see is that, yes, you have this subcellularly confined events, but it is very heterogeneous and heterogeneous, and it's not at all uh, well defined based off of you know location within the cell being having some type of consistent activity. And this can be seen in this uh, right hand figure in the top row, where when we model the activity within a process as a function of its distance from the so from the soma, its longitudinal or geodesic distance away from the soma we're not seeing any type of monotonic behavior. We are seeing heterogeneous and variegated calcium dynamics. So this is one feature that we want to consider when we, when we start to look at the activity within these cells. Another feature is the propagation of events within these cells. So in the bottom row, looking at this figure in the bottom right, we can see again a soma with two processes in the astrocyte. And we're, we can see events originating from process one, and in the right-hand column, events originating from process two. The difference being that the events originating from process one do not break into the soma. They are not propagating and affecting calcium activity within the soma, while events in process two not only affect the calcium within the soma, but also propagate further into the, into the, primar into the other primary process. Um, so this, this speaks to some type of diffusive barrier limiting, pro, uh, limiting propagation, and we want to understand what these are and where and what's, what's causing this type of uh, limiting propagation or difference between the origination of these events and, and where, where these, uh, these influencing factors are spaced throughout the cell. Another thing to consider, another feature of these calcium events is their stochasticity. If we try to categorize events within different regions of these cells, we don't just see, you know, as a readout of a neuron, an action potential, a, a, a fixed type of shape and uh, amplitude, et cetera. We see a distribution of these characteristics. As we can see in, in, these, in these four bar plots here, the, the amplitude as well as duration or even in this bottom row, the shape of individual events is varying. And this, this, is, this is showing us that there is some inherent, uh, inherent stochasticity, as well as even the, the, along with, I should say, the, the, the stochasticity that you're seeing from the stimuli, the random input that is going in potentially to these cells. So we want to categorize what is, what is causing this inherent stochasticity within these, within these astrocytes. And we're going to break that down now. As we start to consider a model for them, we want to under, we were, we're going to outline what are the different features we want to consider. And one of those features is uh, the anatomy of the cell. So if we look at, again, an example of a soma with uh, some processes emanating from it, the anatomy is, is very, it's branched and it's, and it's showing a lot of complexity, which could be a potential source of that variegated intracellular signaling we were seeing. Additionally, we have a lot, we've had a lot of talks today about the interaction between the ER and the cytosol through uh, inositol triphosphate, IP3, and we want to consider the distribution of these endoplasmic reticulum, of these ER stores, and not just the distribution, but their morphology and their shape and interaction with the cytosol as well. Additionally, we need to incorporate the different calcium fluxes. Fluxes such as calcium sources, again, through the IP3 receptors, as well as agonist receptors linking the cell to external stimuli. And we also want to consider these sinks, these, these fluxes of calcium out of the cytosol through different pumps, as well as uh, buffering, which, a, which was, could, could, could be a potential driver behind that, that propagation of, of uh, calcium signals. There are multiple other mechanisms we could consider. There's mitochondria, which have an influence, and we saw that in an earlier talk, uh, the, the influence of mitochondria in these cells, and as well as other mechanisms. But we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the anatomy, as well as some of these major uh, sources and sinks affecting the dynamics of calcium within these cells. So the way we want to break these cells up and to consider this varying, spatially varying morphology and spatially varying physiology is through this compartmentalization, whereby we can take an astrocyte branch, as you see here in the top right, and we can divide it into coaxial cylinders. And by that, I mean each compartment is going to have an external cylinder representing the cytoplasmic space, as well as a concentric internal cylinder representing the calcium, so the endoplasmic reticulum. 
And in this way, we can vary across compartments the relationship between this between the ER and the cytoplasm. And in order to consider this relationship, we have to constrain it, and we want to use uh, some some influential work out of uh, Alexei Semyonov's lab in uh, in 2013, which was gave us a great a great way of characterizing this relationship between the compartments, or the in this case the surface to volume ratio of uh, of an astro astrocytic profile to the fraction of the calcium stores that exist in that in that area, such as in this case the ER. So we can we can use this to uh, to then fit a morphological relationship using an alpha function on this data, and this gives us a representation of the uh, of the the percentage of ER in a given compartment based off of that compartment's surface to volume ratio. To tie this all together, that morphological aspect, we also want to include this uh, this this really important work, as which uh, Maurizio has had a lot of influence on. Over the over the past several years, with his incorporation of IP3 dynamics, and we're going to also add in this, uh, as has been done in previous work, this uh, interaction between the cytosol and the the ER through that morphological relationship on the previous slide. Additionally, we are going to be connecting these compartments through this type of diffusive flux between uh, between concentrations across compartments. This is a this is a model that I have used a lot in the past in the past both for uh, both for publication as well as for my doctoral work and uh, and I want to break down a little bit the 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 way we get to this diffusive term and how we can connect these compartments and we're going to start with some compartmentalized astrocyte we've taken our cell we've taken our astrocyte and we've divided it the regions into these compartments, these cylindrical compartments, which are now need to be connected. And we want to consider two different types of, uh, of connect connections, this, con this uh, consecutive connection, as well as this branching junction in green here. So let's start with a simple case of two or three linearly connected cells, consecutively connected. We can take uh, some, some, inf some inspiration from the diffusion equa equation, the classical diffusion equation, and we can look at a coarse-grained representation of that from the perspective of our compartmentalized astrocyte, where we can look at the, the flux of calcium across one of these membranes from the, by considering the, the, the representation of concentration from the left and from the right. Once we, use the, once we have this discretized flux through, these, through this membrane, we can start to play around with uh, the varying distances and the varying, uh, the varying morphology. And one way we wanna do this is by incorporating the the area of the of the two inter intersecting membranes, and in order to, to to incorporate this area, we are going to be changing units from this, you know, concentration per unit length to per per unit area, and this allows us to get the area of uh, these this varying area across compartments into the equation. And with a little bit of algebraic ma magic, we can arrive at this this ratio of areas between consecutive compartments. And this is allowing us to relate the and incorporate the morphology across compartments. This formulation, which in this case is going uh, from three compartments of you know, CI minus one to CI plus one, can be extended to a branching junction where we have one compartment branching off into two uh, si uh, sibling compartments. And that's simply done by taking that ratio between the, uh, between the resulting branched compartments and iterating over the influences of those concentrations, as we can see here in this, uh, this green branching junction, which we originally saw in that compartmentalized astrocyte earlier. So we've developed this, this uh, compartmentalized representation of calcium dynamics within the cell, and we are, we are incorporating this morphology within these compartments, as well as connecting them through this diffusive flux. So now we can start to look at some of the results which we developed for the Fulbright application. And we're going to start simple with a, uh, a simple structure of a soma and one process where that process has two compartments, uh, a proximal compartment and a peripheral compartment, which is also receiving some type of stochastic input. And we can break this into three tiers of, of, our, of our structure, the soma tier, that proximal tier with the one compartment, and that peripheral tier with, again, one compartment which is receiving input. 
And we're going to be characterizing calcium activity, calcium dynamics within these compartments by keeping count of the time, the spike times or the, the times of calcium elevations, the saline times of calcium elevations, and then binning them or binning the wait time between these spikes to, to, to be able to represent the activity within a given compartment. And here we see that without a lot of variance or complexity in our simple structure, the distribution of activity is relatively consistent across the three tiers, from the soma to the peripheral input receiving tier. But what happens if we start to add branching junctions, those, those branching junctions that we had discussed before? Well, we, in, we introduce complexity, and therefore we start to intro, introduce some interesting dynamics. Specifically, I want to call your attention in this, uh, in this branching junction for the peripheral tier, we have the emergence across this branching junction of a bimodal peak in the ISI distribution. So by adding this branching junction, we have added another type of calcium event in this process, these, uh, this, this wait times uh, of around six seconds here. And additionally, if we move that branching junction closer, we see again a peak here with the proximal branching junction, a peak in the SOMA ISI, or I'm sorry, a bimodal peak in the SOMA ISI. So this is, this is already starting to show some interesting dynamics just with these two simple structures, but we can take it a step further. We can add branching junctions to both tiers. This yields this uh, relatively more complex than the other simpler structures, this structure of a uh, soma with a branching junction and then another branching junction, which we'll denote as S2 and 2, S2, 2. And we can see immediately here the, uh, uh, um, a change in the in the, the differences between the ISI distributions across these three tiers, namely this decrease in soma activity, this from this uh, from showing some kind of unimodal peak to uh, a, a almost uniform distribution of very long wait times as well as shorter wait times between calcium events. We see again this uh, branching junction has caused this has caused this. Uh, this, uh, this emergence of a bimodal distribution of ISI here, as well as these unimodal distributions in the tier two compartments, these peripheral compartments. And another thing to point out in these peripheral compartments is that C2, the input receiving compartment, the red compartment, is its activity is marginally different than the other tier two compartments, which are not receiving input and are connected via indirectly via other compartments. So, these are this is this is just one example of how this has gotten more this has gotten more complex and show, starting to show some variegation. But another thing, and I think an important feature to point out for this uh, for this structure specifically is that we have introduced variegated signaling across our hierarchies, across our different tiers of uh, astrocyte compartments. And what I mean by this is that we're seeing two types of differences as we move between tiers. We are seeing that. A distance, and I should start by I should start by pointing pointing out this this table on the bottom left hand side, which is allowing us to compare our input receiving compartment C2 to other compartments within our different structures, the simplest original structure as well as those two slightly more complex structure, and then the current structure on this slide, the S22 structure, and we see that firstly as we move our Manhattan distance or our connected distance away from the input rece receiving compartment two, we are increasing the, dis the difference between the ISI distributions. We're seeing more difference based off of how far away the, uh, these compartments are from this input receiving compartment. And additionally, something else that's shaping the variegation of this activity is the morphological profile that we have introduced, which is changing from tier to tier. And we can see that the, the, the difference between tiers is also showing a, a, higher, a higher degree of, uh, degree of act difference in activity versus uh, in, in between differences of the, of the same tier. So these two features are pointing towards this overall variegation of, of, uh, of calcium elements or calcium events within, within these different compartments. And another, another topic that I really want to focus on is introducing um, this varying IP3 diffusion and how this affects the system. So in this, in this slide on this figure, we are taking our S22 structure and from left to right, we are increasing the IP3 diffusion. 
So starting with lower diffusion, we have a lot of separation of ISI distributions within the same tier. So a lower IP3 diffusion is causing more differences between these uh, distal compartments, which have you know the same morphology, which have the same the same structure. While increasing this the IP3 diffusion is leading to a, a more of a synchronization of the ISI distributions within the same tiers, the soma, the proximal, and the peripheral. Another another impact is uh, of the increased IP3 diffusion is the introduction of this bimodal distribution in the proximal tier. So it's it's introducing higher IP3 diffusion is introducing more a more saline bimodal distribution or the more defined types of activity within this proximal tier. And these two and these two things point to the potential importance and and the uh, the effect of IP3 diffusion on the propagation of signals and as well as the the variegation of signals within these different structures. So to, to conclude, I, wanna, I, want, I want everybody to leave with some takeaways, which is firstly that morphology and physiology is shaping the compartmentalization of these calcium signals that we are seeing. And this is something that we were showing from, that we saw in the experimental work and we have been able to show a little bit of in this, uh, even with these simple, simple compartmental structures. Additionally, moving into that morphology, as a specific feature of that morph morphology uh, shaping compartmentalization is the idea that branching junctions are accounting for different uh, signals as we move uh, either further away from the input receiving uh, compartment to the soma or closer and or closer along the uh, astrocytic tree. And another thing that is uh, that is happening that I that I want everybody to leave with is the idea that IP3 is controlling the separation between these different types of, of uh, distributions and, and, and characterizing the, a degree of uh, difference between calcium events within different subcellular regions of this, of this compartmental model. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Very nice talk. Very cool results. So, um, I will now proceed to start reading some of the questions, okay? okay. So the first question is uh, from Carlos Vivarillos, who is uh, one of your colleagues, uh, although across uh, the ocean. So Carlos is asking if uh, you can say anything about what is the minimum diameter of the compartments that we use there in order to simulate uh, calcium oscillations and calcium peaks uh, consistently, and whether you could envisage more or less uh, if you can uh, use this model to, to, you know, to address eventually the fact that the astrocyte has a spongy form uh, 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 morphology rather than just a, a tree morphology as you as you define. So what would right. you answer? Uh, great question. So firstly, um, I would have to say that I haven't investigated yet the, uh, the kind of the borderline morphological sh the morphology of, of these cylinders as far as expressing different calcium events. Um, you know, or at least I haven't expressed it. I, 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 you, you can definitely see that as you start to decrease the, uh, the, the size of these compartments that you see the, uh, the the ability to express dynamics disappears. Um, but we haven't, and it's something I think we're going to be looking into is, you know, what, uh, how the, how the changes in morphology and the minimization of the, of the radius or the, the interaction between the ER and the cytosol is going to be affecting calcium dynamics. That's something we want to look at down the road. Um, and the, uh, the second part of that question was, I believe how to start to represent the, the more, uh, peripheral active, the peripheral parts of the cell as opposed to this tree-like structure. Um, I would say that given this current model, it's uh, beyond the scope, but as we start to incorporate more, uh, more types of calcium dynamics, I think that'll become a very interesting question that we can, that we can look at. And I haven't thought much about how we can, how we can start to, um, 
start to express this uh, this branching off into almost like a sponge-like activity. I haven't thought too much about that, but I'd be very interested to 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 hear thoughts on 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 how we could go in that direction. Okay, thank you. You have uh, another question uh, by Rudiger, who actually who was uh, speaking earlier today. So <clears throat> the question is, uh, um, if you change the total calcium flux per compartment, okay, as a function of compartment size, okay. Right. Uh, wait a second, because I'm missing the question. Ah, do you, ah, sorry, sorry, do you change? Sorry, no. So, okay, I, 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 was, I was asking. So, yes, so, well, I can answer him, but you can also say. So, Rudiger is asking, essentially, if we are scaling calcium flux by the volume of the compartment. Yes, and, uh, and I kind of threw those jumble of, uh, of that diffusive flux, characterizing that diffusive flux. The idea is that we're incorporating the area, or the, in this case, the difference between area of consecutive compartments as far as scaling the flux or the influence that one compartment has on a, another compartment of a different size. So we are incorporating that in our diffusive flux term, which is connecting all of our compartments. Okay, any further question? Okay, so thank you, Evan, very much for the nice talk. And you, uh, I will uh, invite now on stage the last speaker of this fantastic workshop, Amita Garval from uh, Berlin, the Heidelberg University in Berlin, and uh, please, Amit, uh, join in. Okay, Amit, uh, let's try to say hello. hello. How are you doing? Very good. good so good. let's try. Let's try to see first if you're able to share your screen, and then I will proceed uh, with the introduction. Amit uh, has uh, started more or less by now, I guess, 15 years ago, perhaps, uh, with doing his undergrad and grad training at Max Planck Institute for Molecular Medicine, Experimental Molecular Medicine, and the August University in Göttingen, under the supervision of a prominent molecular biologist, uh, that is uh, Klaus Armin Nafe. So then he moved to John Hopkins, and uh, eventually in 2017, he came back to Germany and Europe, where he took over a position as principal investigator at uh, Heidelberg University um, and uh, at, the, at the Institute of Anatomy and Cell Biology. So he's the recipient of uh, several prestigious awards, uh, including, well, from early times, the Barry Hood Jr. Young Investigator Award, the yeah, Anuga Damarao Memorial Award, more recently, a Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, also called NRSTAT, Young Investigator Award, and the Kika and Heinz Saller Research Group Leader Award is uh, a work is mostly, I say mostly because you never know what is the future reserving, but is uh, on neuroglia interactions and in particular on calcium signaling. And we owe to him as well uh, one of the first studies in vivo on the study of calcium signaling in mitochondria and their contribution in astrocytes. Uh, and with that in mind, I leave the stage to Amit and looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Maurizio. It was uh, really great. So first, I just want to make sure that you can see me and you can also see my screen. So is that the case? Absolutely, you can okay, go on. Good. Yeah, so because it is difficult to know what is going on. Great, so uh, thank you for um, uh, inviting me for this uh, fantastic uh, conference. I really, truly enjoyed it. So thanks, many, many thanks to all the organizers. Um, and um, actually, Ivan's talk was a very nice primer for my talk because I will be touching base to almost um, most of the things he talked about, but more experimental. I'm an experimentalist and uh, less of a modeler. So, uh, well, uh, let's start with the astrocytes. So uh, astrocytes are very complex cells, uh, which we don't have to retrate. It was really beautifully shown in uh, Leonid Svetsinko's talk yesterday for when he was modeling uh, uh, um, uh, astro and also in uh, Alexei Simonov's talk and several other talks like also Ivan's talk that these are highly complex cell, if not the most complex cell uh, uh, in the brain. And uh, the, um, Complexity was uh, really well uh, uh, understood and studied 
But most of the study in astrocyte, uh, in terms of calcium, in terms of calcium modeling, in terms of understanding the nature of the astrocyte physiology has been done on cultured astrocyte, which look quite different. Uh, they are different kind of cell. They are definitely astrocyte. This is an image of human astrocytes uh, in culture. And uh, if you look at this humble looking mouse astrocyte, uh, here uh, is an astrocyte expressing the red fluorescent protein, TD tomato. And we can already see that, that they make these not only branches, but very fine spongy form like processes. And uh, this was already appreciated more than 30 years back by Hama and Kosaka using high voltage electron microscopy. So in this image, you can see that, that uh, the astrocyte is less of a soma and main processes, but it is full of these very fine branches. And these fine processes make contact with synapses. As you can see in blue, these very fine processes of astrocyte, they touch the pre and post synapse, pre synapse shown in green and the post synapse shown uh, with this post synaptic density in red. And these processes can be as thin as 40 nanometers. And uh, that is a place where a lot of calcium exchange happens. And many times in these cultured astrocyte configuration, we will not be able to know uh, at the business end of the cell what is going on uh, in terms of how the cells are communicating. And the same thing goes also for the blood vessels. Uh, at the lumen, you can see again the process in blue. Uh, 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 here, marked in B, that this is an astrocyte process. They form the blood-brain barrier. And again, this is the business end of the cell where they interact with the neighboring cells, They're given it is a blood vessel, or even they interact with oligodendrocytes. So here, what I'm trying to get at is that, that uh, these cells communicate at the very fine processes and not much with the soma or the main process. So we tried that, can we understand or look at the calcium at these processes? So for example, here, if we take an example of a synapse, so here we have a pre and a post synapse. I think now I got my cursor somehow. So here is a pre and a post synapse. When it releases a neurotransmitter, the calcium goes high up in the cell. And uh, this is again, a very old um, video from um, Steve Smith's lab, Cornbell video. Many of us have already seen it. First time to show that, that uh, how a puff, of a puff of glutamate on astrocyte, cultured astrocyte leads to these calcium waves and also beautiful calcium transients. And the bigger question uh, here remains is that, that what are these, when do these calcium transients uh, arise uh, within the cell? And how are these calcium transients regulated? And to begin with, what are these calcium transients, what does this calcium transient mean to a cell or to a neighboring cell with which they are communicating? So these are much larger questions, uh, which we will not, we will try to, it will take probably my whole career or many careers to able to understand that. But with that aim, uh, we decided to look into the finer details of the calcium transients. So we use uh, GCAMPs and we use uh, uh, transgenic mice, which express GCAMPs specifically in astrocyte. Here you can see that, that um, uh, the GCAMP uh, is expressed in uh, a single astrocyte. One little dot uh, on the screen, what you see is a single astrocyte. Uh, uh, in this image, which is a zoom in image in the hippocampus, uh, the labeling shows GFAP, which is the very standard marker for uh, uh, astrocyte. And uh, these are membrane anchored GCAMP astrocyte pups. And we can already see that the GFAP is staining, which shows the major branches. We hardly see any part of the cell, almost eight or 9% of the cell is visible. Uh, this is a, a zoom in image of one of the astrocyte confocal Z-stack to show that, that our sensor, which is tagged to the membrane. So we have membrane anchored the GCAMP3, which is a, um, a genetically encoded calcium sensor. So now these sensors can go to the fine astrocyte process. As you can see here in the center, that circular structure is a soma and that is not filled up with um, uh, GCAMP as uh, uh, should be the case for the membrane anchored protein. So how does the calcium transient look like in these astrocytes? So here on the left, you see an astrocyte imaged in a brain slice. Today, I will be presenting only brain slice data, no in vivo data. And uh, uh, here, uh, when we do the imaging uh, in the presence of TTX to block the neuronal activity, to isolate the astrocyte activity, we developed uh, an algorithm to analyze these calcium transients. Uh, which happens in a very restricted pockets called microdomain, hotspots, any spots you can call, or uh, people have given different names. And we can isolate these uh, uh, calcium transients um, uh, very nicely using our algorithm, which we call Cascade. It is available, it's published, so whoever is interested should feel free to use it. And when we apply norepinephrine, for example, 
it's a very potent stimuli for the cell. You see that, that the whole cell comes up and immediately it goes down and goes back to its calcium uh, oscillations, what it was going through. And uh, this was very unique for uh, actually norepinephrine. Other uh, neurotransmitters, when we apply, like for ATP or DHPG, does not give this kind of effect. I'll come to it a bit later on in my talk. So this particular cell, when we image for five minutes, um, this is, uh, uh, we, we pull out a lot of active regions. Uh, we call it um, microdomains. And here I've picked up like 10 uh, microdomains and we can see we get very uh, beautiful signal to noise ratio. There is a whole diversity of the calcium transient. And here I would like to bring your attention to, for example, two domains which are close as three or four, domain three and four, they are very close to each other spatially, probably a couple micrometer, but they behave very differently. The calcium transients within these pockets are very different. Also, same thing for eight and nine. They, they have different, very different set of calcium transient, telling that, that the anatomical location uh, or how these uh, domains are anatomically located will also control the diffusion and also the calcium transient, though they look very close, but they might be very restricted connectivity between them. So this uh, 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 plot of all these domains, which we picked up, 125 of them, we see that, that there is not much of a pattern. We don't see a calcium wave within a cell going from one corner to the other. These transient tend to be very stochastic and also very sparse. So for example, if we image a cell for five minutes and most of the domains here, we have accumulated uh, from 114 cells, more than 8,000 events that 70% of the event in a given domain um, are just once in five minutes, which is very rare. Only few domains, which uh, are really, really low, as you can see, can have like tens of events. Um, and this was also the case for SOMA. So this is the case for SOMA, that the somatic events are also very rare. Uh, and that always made people think that astrocyte does not participate actively in the neuronal processing. But this is one single plane of an astrocyte. And if we think about an astrocyte like a puff and, and do a back of envelope calculation, there might be eight to 10,000 of such domains. And even the uh, active ones, you can already calculate that, that a given astrocyte will be active all the time. And this was very beautifully shown by work of Andrea Volterra and Erika Bendici uh, in the 3D imaging that, that um, uh, you can see that that uh, kind of activity ongoing in an astrocyte. Here, uh, uh, one thing which I wanted to bring is that many of these domains do they ha they have the sparse activity, but they can also come uh, together to have a much larger event, which you also see. So, for example, here highlighted like event uh, domains like one, two, three, four, five, six. They at one point, one given time, they come up together, but afterward they are doing their own kind of stuff, showing that it is not that they are only segregated, but a larger calcium event can also induce calcium in the neighboring domains. Uh, one thing which was already appreciated long time back, also discussed by Alexis Semenov yesterday in his talk, was that, that most of these calcium transients, the spontaneous ones, are not blockable by blockal of basal synaptic transmitters. So, for example, a combination of baflomycin and TTX blocks the basal synaptic transmission, but it does not block these spontaneous calcium transients in the astrocyte, indicating that, that there might be other source than only the neuronal activity within these cells. So, astrocyte have spontaneous calcium transient and there are induced ones. So they can be induced, for example, uh, by uh, putting neuromodulators or neurotransmitters. Here, for example, neuro, uh, norepinephrine, I showed you in the video, when we apply norepinephrine, there is a very like locked, very simultaneously, most of these transients uh, come together. There is a big diversity, as you can see in this correlation coefficient plot, that some cells have almost 80% of the uh, cells, uh, microdomains coming up together on application of norepinephrine, but roughly 50% of the microdomain comes up uh, when we apply norepinephrine. But this is not the case when we apply other agonists, very potent one like ATP, purinergic receptor agonist does not do so. And also DHPG, which is an agonist of uh, 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 group one, MGLUARs, group one, um, uh, or mainly MGLUR5s, which is expressed in these cells. The other thing which we tried to do was that, that uh, we said, okay, great, uh, when we apply repetitively within the same cell, different kind of um, uh, neuromodulators or uh, activators of different uh, receptors, for example, uh, nor norepinephrine for adrenergic receptors or ATP for pyrenergic receptor, it generates different map, thereby indicating that, that probably the distribution of different receptors on the astrocyte should also be considered. It is not that everything is homogeneous. 
the, the somatic information tells us that, that okay, great, when you apply many of these uh, agonists, the soma always comes up, but this is not the case for the uh, 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 neuromodulators or, neuro, uh, or other activators, which is released by neurons or other cells in that case. Here in the overlay, you can see roughly 50% of the uh, norepinephrine and ATP activated microdomain overlap. When we do the same thing with ATP and DHPG, the overlap is far less. It's roughly 35% indicating that, that we have to consider the heterogeneity of the expression of these receptors within the cell, which itself can lead to different modalities of calcium transient. IP3 receptor 2, we heard a lot about IP3 receptor. IP3 receptor 2s are the main receptors expressed by the astrocyte. Uh, there are literature people talking about 1 and 3 being expressed, but at very, very low level, but they are main receptors. Um, almost um, uh, 12, 13 years back by the lab of Ken McCarthy, it was shown that, that when you knock out IP3 receptors, the spontaneous as well as the evoked activity is gone. With that idea, we did an experiment during that time uh, that, that we uh, blocked the circa pump. We soaked the slices for one hour to empty the internal stores. And we saw reasonable amount of calcium transient, spontaneous calcium transient within the astrocyte in slices. And that was uh, a bit surprising given the published results. And uh, when we started digging into the literature, we thought that maybe now we are seeing many, many more calcium transient in the final processes where probably Papsi Gargan does not reach to the highest concentration. So we decided to go and generate a triple transgenic mice, and namely IP3 receptor 2 combined with our double transgenic mice where we image calcium transient. So. The knockout of calcium transient uh, uh, in these mice uh, with knockout of IP3 receptor 2, we were kind of surprised to see that, that these uh, cells, astrocyte here again, uh, had significant amount of calcium activity. This activity is reduced, as you can see when you compare on the left-hand side the panel where you have spontaneous activity, this activity, the number of uh, uh, microdomains and also the frequency of event is reduced significantly by two-third or up to 70 percent. But one thing is there that when we apply norepinephrine or matter of fact ATP or other agonists, you don't see this activation. So uh, the spontaneous activity persisted, a reduced level, and most of the evoked activity was gone in these cells. So now the question arose was what is the source of the spontaneous activity within these cells and what we have been missing? So to cut the long story short, um, this in, uh, I, uh, the indication came when we were doing this um, uh, electron microscopy, so transmission electron microscopy using silver intensified immunogol labeling. So now, since we were expressing a membrane tag protein, GCAN is a modified GFP, a membrane tag protein, we thought we can we now look at the astrocyte processes, fine processes specifically of the astrocyte. And using the immunogol labeling, when we label GCAM, we see fine processes of astrocyte, as you can see in red. And one thing which became very apparent was these processes were filled with mitochondria. For example, in the zoom in here, you see that, that some of the uh, processes have the mitochondria just almost stuffed into it, so much so that that uh, almost GCAMP is stuck almost on the mitochondria surface, it seems like. As you can see here on the top image or also in the lower image, uh, that, that these process, the astrocyte process very close to the nerve terminals, uh, uh, as you can see, has mitochondria there. So it clicked that, oh, mitochondria can be a source as well as the sink for the calcium. So can it be that the remaining activity, which we are seeing in IP3 receptor 2 knockout mice, are generated by mito mitochondria. So we generated to design uh, uh, and develop a new mouse line where we can uh, express uh, uh, mitochondrially tagged EGFT specifically in astrocytes. Here it is a triple transgenic mice expressing cytosolic uh, TD tomato in the astrocyte and mitochondrial um, uh, EGFP in the uh, astrocytes too. And here you can see this is a single cortical astrocyte uh, this labeled with GFAP here, that, that um, uh, this cell is filled with mitochondria. We did recently a quantification in a single cell, a single astrocyte can have a cortical astrocyte can have up to 1500 to 2000 mitochondria. We are now studying the mitochondria dynamics more in detail. I will be not talking about it, following in vivo imaging and see that, that what does this mitochondria architecture mean to the cell and how it can be involved in regulating the calcium transients. So coming back to, uh, do these calcium transients, which we see, co-localize with mitochondria? So when we do the measurement of the calcium transient, here mitochondria EGFP is pseudo-colored for ease in seeing. 
Most of these calcium transient do co-localize with mitochondria up to 90%. So 90% of the my, uh, calcium spontaneous calcium transient, which we see overlaps very beautifully with mitochondria, indicating that that mitochondria might have some role to play. So we said that if we can go and uh, close all the um, pores, whether it is MCU or whether it is membrane permeability transition pore or sodium calcium exchanger, can we block these remaining uh, uh, spontaneous calcium transients, which we see in IP3 receptor 2. So again, to cut uh, the long story short, we, uh, when we blocked the uh, mitochondrial permeability transition pore by cyclosporine and rotenone in the slices, we see that virtually all the remaining or most of the remaining IP3 receptor 2 calcium transient in IP3 receptor 2 knockout mice were gone, indicating that they were being generated by the transient flickering of um, uh, membrane permeability transition pores on uh, on uh, mitochondria. So now the question arose is that, that, well, this is the exit path, as you can see, MPTP, then there is an entry path to the calcium also. And the main entry path for the uh, mitochondrial calcium is MCU, mitochondrial unipotor. So that time we raised a question that, that can we see now these spontaneous calcium flickering, which we see in the cytosol also within the mitochondria. And if we evoke a large calcium rise within the uh, cell by, for example, applying norepinephrine, can we see this calcium channeling in the mitochondrial matrix? So for that, we designed a AAB and we drove it by GFAP, minimal GFAP promoter and tagged GCAM6S with mitochondria tagging sequence, again, uh, imaged in the uh, uh, acute brain slice from the adult animals. Uh, and here we see that, that uh, uh, there are spontaneous flickers in the mitochondria. And when we apply norepinephrine, uh, there is also like a synchronous activity within mitochondria also. And you will see that a lot of uh, mitochondria will all come up together, indicating that, that not only the cytosolic calcium transient we see, but this also dictated into mitochondrial matrix calcium transient. So to analyze the uh, entire uh, uh, set of data which we are acquiring, we have developed, uh, uh, revamped our old uh, cytosolic calcium transient um, analysis method for um, uh, analyzing the mitochondrial calcium signal. They turn out to be a very different characteristic, so we have to revamp it. I will not go into the detail. It uses the same kind of machine learning algorithm uh, to really pull the signal and to uh, classify the signals. So how do the signal look like? So if we see the spontaneous calcium transient, uh, there are a big diversity of signals. Some signals are very large. They can last for a minute, as you can see in the upper two traces. But some signals are very fast within a few seconds, almost like a cytosolic second, as you can see in the yellow or orange traces. And some signals can be basically recurrent, as you see in trace number five. When we apply um, norepinephrine, uh, there are many regions which were not active during the spontaneous activity comes up, as you can see from those red boxes. And the signal prolongs. Not only the intensity, as you can see in this heat map, uh, the amplitude of the signal increases, but also some the, the, the duration of the signals increases. For example, some of them can last for several minutes. Uh, as you can see from the scale bar there, that, that one of the upper blue signal is uh, going beyond three minutes. So these cells can really take up, these mitochondria can really take up calcium and, and keep for, for more prolonged time, which is very distinct. The similar experimental setting, the cytosolic calcium goes down completely, Probably it is buffered very nicely by mitochondria and then slowly released by the mitochondria. So now the question is, this is still a hypothesis. We have not really seen it. So the idea is that can we simultaneously measure cytosolic calcium transient and the mitochondrial uh, uh, transient? So now we have decided that that can be take use of the red mitochondrial uh, 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 targeted sensor. We already have membrane anchored GCAMP uh, for cy um, uh, cytosolic calcium transient. So can we, use or put the uh, sensor within the mitochondria matrix. So we decided to go for JRGECO1A. Uh, this uh, uh, calcium sensor is in the red, uh, uh, is derived from the red fluorescent protein and um, uh, has a characteristic very similar to GCAM6S. Uh, so it's very sensitive. And it has a low KD, as, as I said, for the uh, same like GCAM6S. And also it has two PKA values, which is very ideal for mitochondria, for example, because the compartment within the mitochondria can go very quickly from acidic to alkaline. So there's a lot of fluctuation, which is not very good for GCAM, like GFP-derived sensor, but is good for the red person protein-like derived calcium sensor.
So first thing what we did was that we tagged this sensor to the mitochondria. These are in hex cells to show that that well can we uh, uh, um, really uh, send it to the mitochondria or sometimes these sensors are finicky. So this sensor does go it, go to the mitochondria. When we apply ionomycin to increase the cytosolic calcium transient, we see beautiful calcium increase. So we have now designed the mouse lines. We have the mouse line and we are crossing these animals to simultaneously image calcium transient in the cytosol as well as uh, uh, in the um, uh, mitochondria, and both in the living animals now very soon, as well as in the slices to be able to understand that, that what are the dynamics and the kinetics of these calcium transients and how this uh, interplay between the mitochondrial and cytosolic calcium transient occurs. So to summarize what I've been telling, so the uh, uh, what we have been thinking about, and, and of course it is central to the mitochondrial calcium handling, the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, uh, for example, circa pump IP3 receptor 2, and also they are induced by a very complex plethora of G protein coupled receptor expressed by these cells. But we think that in the new model, we need to integrate mitochondria because it seems that, that the way they are located anatomically and how they handle the calcium immediately within the cells, they can really change the not only the how the calcium is handled within the cell, but also the characteristic of the calcium signals, prolonging the calcium signal. So for example, it might be that the endoplasmic mediated calcium signals are much more faster. And it is just at the level which we study them is prolonged just because of mitochondrial intervention. So this is our model of looking at the uh, micro domains of astrocyte, including both endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. And probably we will have many, much more uh, detailed um, uh, data, calcium data between how these two organelles talk to each other in the smaller compartment uh, of astrocyte. With that, I would like to uh, thank my lab, uh, relatively new, uh, we are two year old. Uh, and uh, most of these experiments uh, uh, of astrocyte is really uh, put forward by a um, uh, postdoc uh, from Chile, Felipe Bodaleo uh, Torres, and a very talented master student who has been developing the code. And uh, we have a lot of collaborators where we are doing the structural analysis of mitochondria in collaboration with the uh, Department of Stefan Hell and also in the uh, Department of Klaus Nave in Göttingen. And uh, uh, several of these lines and tools were developed while I was still in the lab of Dwight Burgos at Johns Hopkins. So many thanks to him. And also we are doing some pathological study with uh, a Gabo Pepsol at BZNE. And uh, with that, uh, I will be happy to take question. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, very beautiful work and results. Um, so yeah, we have several yeah. questions, uh, I guess, yes, uh, as they uh, are popular. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well, and I'm trying to do some. So, uh, should I just keep my talk in there? It will be better. Uh, no, just uh, just uh, uh, well, I mean. Oh, stop sharing. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Just keep the slide like this. Okay, gonna perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, in case you need to scroll yeah. down and up, it's gonna be okay. Yes. So, the first question comes from Kirsten Lent, uh, who you may know is yes. Ampere University, yeah. right, Kirsten? So um, she's asking um, whether the images that you are showing are only, I mean, or the analysis that you perform are only based on single plane images or you have other images. And in particular, would you say that, what would you say are the different sources of uh, spontaneity uh, when you show the images of stimulation by norepinephrine or ATP or spontaneous calcium? Could this be coming from different sources in the cell or could be an artifact maybe of different uh, imaging planes? Okay, so there are several questions, I think. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a into, question. Exactly, so we, we start with Rai. Uh, hey, Kestin, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I will divide into three parts, uh, this question. So the first part is that, that uh, most of the imaging, is it coming from a single multi-photon plane or it is coming from uh, 3D images? Uh, so most of the images which I showed you uh, do come from a kind of single plane, I can say. We image four planes for mitochondria, especially for the calcium transient, cytosolic calcium transient, we do only single plane imaging. So essentially, we are just sampling one micrometer Z plane of a cell because that is a, a two photon, essentially a rule of thumb, two photon per section. 
So we are collecting data from only one micrometer of a Z plane for cytosolic. In terms of mitochondria, they do move. So we collect the data from roughly four to five micrometer and we collapse them together to make sure that, that uh, certain mitochondria are not just running in and out and that generates a pseudo signal. So that is kind of 3D. We are trying to image, uh, mitochondrial calcium transients are slow. We are trying to image the mitochondrial transient in 3D, but there are a lot of problems. And one of the problem is a registration problem. If we image the cell, my, mitochondria, or any kind of transients for cell for half an hour or so, uh, we generate massive amount of data. And then to uh, register them in 4D plane, X, Y, Z, and T, is not that trivial. So we are now giving up partly for our 3D project, but so short answer is most of the data is in the single plane, but we are trying multiple planes. Second was that, that other sources of calcium transients, uh, the spontaneous one, quite likely, that you are interested in. So yes, there are other planes that are beautiful work from Andrea Volterra's lab, as I said, also from Alexis Semenov's lab, recent paper from Christian Henneberger, Baljit Karp. So there are a lot of uh, excellent groups who are looking into this question. And it seems that, that uh, uh, also the extracellular uh, calcium does play a role. So when some of these labs depleted extracellular calcium, they show that, that um, uh, these calcium transients also vanish in IP3 receptor to knockout. But this can also be uh, like also you're vacating the uh, mitochondrial calcium. So it is a very complicated problem for which we don't have a very easy answer. But there can be surface receptors which might be involved in this. At least we did not find a major contributor, single major contributing receptor. So your third question is related wow. to the activation, right? Yes, exactly. So that when you activate with uh, some of these norepinephrine or so, so there one thing which I did not understand was what do you mean by artifact? So well. Uh, so the specific question is, I, I can read it to you textually. So as for Basin, so when you show the overlap of stimulation by norepinephrine and ATP, could they actually stem from different parts of the astrocytes or different imaging planes? No. So this is the, the, we can be sure that, that we are in the same imaging plane uh, because one thing which you did not see is that, that um, um, several times we also have a structural marker, uh, TD tomato. And also we know uh, when we image the cell that, that we have not moved too much on the plane. So yes, most of the data comes from single plane. These are, uh, if not a um, hundred, but then probably several dozen of cells imaged. And also what we do is when we apply drugs, we apply the drugs randomly. We don't apply them in a particular sequence just because of the same concern which we had is that, that of course, when you activate the cell with let's say norepinephrine, and then you activate with uh, ATP, then maybe there is some kind of weird kind of receptor desensitization, who knows? So to make sure that the, all these uh, drugs were applied in a different uh, order, first maybe the HPG, second norepinephrine, ATP, and then you can mix match. So from the toss-off point to make sure that this does not come from that. So we tried our best at our level to make sure that, that most of these artifacts, either plane change or some pharmacology does not uh, mark our result. I, I might uh, turn, I might have a question on that, but first I want to read uh, the question from the other from the audience. So Alexei Brasse is uh, following up and he has several questions. So first of all, how stable or reproducible are the microdomain spatial maps uh, uh, subjected to multiple administration of the same drug? Uh, they, are, uh, they are very, very stable. Actually, this was one of the reviewers question, which we got and we went and did. Uh, uh, I might be the reviewer. You uh, never know. Exactly. There you go. So, so this was one of the reviewer questions where we um, uh, did a, a couple experiment uh, to make sure that that was the case. So there are certain things to it. So when you, we follow the spontaneous activity for a long time, then it does seem that these pockets of activity uh, has some anatomical basis to it. And hence they are reproducible. So they come up time and time again. When we apply, let's say, same agonist over several times, let's say first time we apply, let's say, ATP, we wait for another 10 minutes, wash off, we apply again ATP, we wash off for another 10 minutes, we apply again ATP. There is some receptor desensitization, but uh, uh, most of the similar domains can be reproducibly evoked. Uh, a calcium can be evoked in the uh, similar domain. So it seems very reproducible. And now with our long-term calcium imaging, which we are doing in the animal for up to a month, looking at these domains uh, in vivo in the single cell level. And there also seems to be a high level of, um, uh, let's say, restriction that, that the, the, these domains seems to be very, not transient, but uh, quite permanent. They change a bit, but they're there, uh, restricted, telling that it is an anatomical basis. 
And uh, well, so always uh, Alexei is asking if uh, you see any correlation between the micro domain shape and actual astrocytic morphology. Oh my God, that's a very hard one. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, for, that, uh, for that, there was a very nice paper recently published in Nature Communication uh, from the uh, collaborative work with um, uh, several labs who were part of it, but it was uh, from the lab of Valentin Nalo. So they combined STED to see the astrocyte morphology. Astrocyte morphology, as you know, Alexei, is not very easy to look at even at the normal light microscopic level. So they combined STED microscopy with two photon imaging to image calcium dynamics. And it seems that, that uh, the, there are, they came up with uh, that, that this tripartite synapse, that, that there are certain nodes where the calcium transients are more often than the other places. So yes, people are trying it. We haven't tried it yet to combine both of them. Fantastic. Uh, very, very nice work. So um, I guess uh, if the audience is coming up with other questions, Okay, so no more questions. I mean, thank you very much again for, uh, for your talk and your contribution. And uh, I am going now to shut down. No, well, Ivo is going to kick you out. You're not yeah. the required. Uh -huh. We are, we are uh, saluting and uh, thank you again, all the audience, our uh, speakers for these uh, two days of, uh, I hope you enjoy these, uh, I mean, I, I think we did as organizers, although we were between uh, following you and uh, and doing a lot of technical uh, inquiries and texting behind. Uh, I think it was a fantastic from our point of view um, uh, workshop and uh, we are very thrilled uh, to have uh, coordinated this uh, effort to bring it together people and investigators from seemingly uh, disparate uh, uh, fields uh, that however you see uh, when brought together they can cross-contaminate ideas on such uh, transversal topics as calcium signaling that is really ubiquitous and um, I would like to thank the organizers and uh, co-organizers Ivo Sitman that is on the other side of the half of the screen Thank you, Ivo, very much for your support and help. Ben Shinkao, who is uh, by now, unfortunately, in the time zone uh, difference is not uh, in favor of him to be with us here. And uh, along with that, also the main meeting organizers to allowing us um, to, 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 to showcase this workshop, and uh, as well as the um, uh, technical volunteers and supporters and uh, the technical staff uh, that was able to always uh, uh, back up on us and save us in some of the difficult situations we had over these past uh, two days. And I guess also for those of you that are not aware, they did a huge job in order to set up these uh, main meeting and these workshops, uh, facing sometimes harsh criticism and outbursts of frustration with technological platforms directly from some of the organizers. I speak for direct experience, but uh, they excuse me right now. And uh, uh, again, thank you very much uh, for your participation. And uh, then to the next time. And thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.